All right. Oh, that's okay. Hold on. Let me just put full screen. Yeah, let's jump in. Uh, we're, it's it. This is live. We're live. We're in. Oh, shit. You're, you're still in Tacoma. You have a very holy thing going on with the Oh, light. I got the light. It looks like uh, I look angelic or something. Uh, yeah, like if I was watching a film, I'd be like, okay, he's the fucking <laughs> we get it. savior he, Jesus. guy. I'm like right. Willem Dafoe in, uh, in Platoon. It's just like too obvious. All right. Um, I like we're already back into shitting on Platoon. <laughs> um, I mean, do you feel... Is it okay arguing with someone who looks angelic or should i like move around i think it's fine maybe i'll fuck with my light i'll go like i'm kind of mysterious <laughs> you, look, you, know? you look very dark now yeah yeah the light in the darkness um no it's like annoying right let me well can you move your noggin a little bit to cover it up it's just yeah when it doesn't sprinkle through <laughs> you look like fucking uh cool hand luke in that one scene um I, I think i'll just turn the god damn it that's great. You got a nice, what is that, a washer dryer back there? <laughs> this is a terrible background now. No, it's great. Nobody gives a fuck about the background. They just want right. to hear my brilliance and your dog shit. You can see my CPAP machine in the back. <laughs> the is that what that is? Yeah. Um, yeah, let's, uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's get into it. Um, so, I don't know where to start. So, yeah, I, I had, I had never, I had seen League of Their Own a bunch. As a kid, it was on loop. Yeah. Uh, I had vaguely seen uh, um, Field of Dreams, and I saw Bull Durham for the first time. You want to start with, I don't know, Field of Dreams? Oh, hold on. So I, I just want to say a couple of things. So you didn't get to Major League. Because I really wanted I to get to Major, Major League. League. And I, you know what? After this week, I'll be able to see more movies. I, I, this is my last week with my family. I'm, I'm going back to New York tomorrow. Oh, great. Yeah, maybe I'll yeah. see you or whatever. But, I shaved my beard and like I have a my sister's kid is like a baby and she looked at me and she just started sobbing in complete terror and it's just such a weird thing to have someone just crying just from looking at you and just like sobbing in so much uh, like fear from just your face but anyway well it's probably jarring it's not that you're you're like fat and ugly and weird and retarded <laughs> that doesn't help but i'm but it's probably just jar because you look like a different person she's probably like there's some weirdo in my house i know but like whenever you get a shave you feel a little insecure and then to have a baby just look at you and be like ah! Ah! like just cry i look so much like a baby right now doing that which is upsetting all right um, <laughs> that reminds me of my nephew one time um, when he was like a kid. He was like four. Well, first I had the joke about it about is why are your teeth all yellow? And I said, because oh, yeah, Santa Claus is real. Thank you. But there was another time he was like, your breath is bad. And then there was like a beat, like a perfect comedic beat, and he went, it's always bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was so painful because you're like, like, like your joke about fat. It's just like he doesn't, he doesn't know. Yeah, what, it, yeah. He's not trying to be mean. He's just being observant, you know. How's this for like naked gun humor? My niece was five. I once asked her if she like could name all her uncles and aunts, and she said, "They already have names, idiot." Oh wow, that's that's great. pretty good. That's pretty good uh, word wordplay, right? Yeah, that's tremendous. She yeah, is better comic than I am. Yeah, um, that's what I was gonna say. Um, <laughs> so we didn't get to talk about Major League. I want you to see Major League because it's such a great comedy, and there's yeah. so many great jokes. So. Um, but we'll talk I'll, about it another time. Yeah, I'll, I'll watch it. Actually, I probably won't, but <laughs> or maybe we'll do another baseball one. You know, there's like, we, we can do we, tw 12 yeah. of them. The natural um, we, and uh, the Sandlot, the natural major league. Right. Bad news bears. Oh the best yeah. One, but I guess that we can do a children's baseball one, you know? Oh, yeah, I, I guess. I mean, major league and bad news bears aren't really children. Nor is Bull Durham. It's like one of the most adult movies I've ever seen, but, uh, what do you want to start with? I saw League of Their Own first. All right, we can start with the League of Their Own. I just want to say this first and foremost, because this, I mean, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but our relationship could be on the line here because I'm just going to say Feel the Dreams means more to me than, than most people in my life. And um, I love all these movies. It's weird because we keep doing this show. And for the most part, I'm such a cunt of a guy and I have a reputation for being such a movie cunt, but we keep watching all movies that I love. Right. And you're out here doing research. I didn't watch any of these because I've seen each of them probably 40, 70 and 100 times respectfully. You watch movies more compulsively than a lot of people. So you can rem you have it like in your bones. I I've seen these movies like once when I was a kid. So I have to like rewatch, you know? Yeah, you're a loser, you probably, but, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, but uh, I mean, it's going to be contentious. I truly thought Field of Dreams was one of the dumbest things I've ever seen. And that's not I mean, contrarian. That's just straight from my soul. But, uh, but let's, I mean, let's unbelievable. <laughs> you, I, I cannot even I, let's save that, I guess. But I can't imagine that somebody is going to be your life partner. I mean, that's just unbelievable. <laughs> Let's should we say let's save to the end or something. Sure. Let's okay. Let's start with the League of Their Own because I I, I don't know. Let's start with the League of Their Own. <laughs> uh, what you want to go first or what do you want? You go say? first. You go first. What do you want to say about it? You know. a, a League of Their Own. I like. It's very good. It's a very good film and uh, it's fun. It's a little a little sentimental at times. Overly sentimental. A and, little. <laughs> and um, there's you know there's some cheese on there. Um, but there's some great jokes. Uh, it does contain, and I, I want to talk about this because you quoted. There's so many, it. Yeah. There's so many moments in. Wait, what was that? You quoted a line from it recently, like on the phone where we're talking. You know, not talking, but like you quoted a line. Maybe we we're texting a long time ago. You quoted a line. The hard part. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, so it it contains a bunch of moments I want to talk about. There's a lot of all these movies have parallels in comedy to me, but. There's a moment in this film script that is one of the most insane. In fact, maybe I'll describe it and you'll know what I'm talking about. Maybe uh -huh. not. I always want to talk about this everywhere. And I'm so glad we have this podcast because it has a place for some of these thoughts to live right. that I'm always thinking about. It's like stand up bits, but people don't remember the movie enough. So you can kind of just <laughs> have to do them on a podcast. You know? Exactly. So there's a moment in that movie that is so crazily written to me it stands out as like a moment of like this movie's great but this one moment is so insane to me if it does it involve psychopathic behavior yes it does well there's a couple okay. i wonder which one but well, we talked about one maybe earlier so i'm assuming it's that one but there's one part where the thing that you look back now and you're like it seems like a funny shenanigan back then mm -hmm. but seems so is when you poison someone to go out on the town when they when they poison <laughs> that that uh that the lady who's watching them all. I right. mean that's an insane. That was like a kind of a fun gag, but that's an insane thing to do to poison someone. She's right. poisoned and she's throwing up all night, and they're just so they can go dance. Like that's an like she's throwing up. She's on like death's door. I mean that's kind of psychopathic. But you, I assume you mean the ball one, right? Yes. So, okay. So we talked about this before. <laughs> did, did it stand out to you watching this movie? It, it wouldn't have started out. You are right. It's like a trope. But if you think about it, you're like, that's insane. It, once you brought it up, I was like, oh yeah, that's crazy. But so for the list, for the people who don't remember when Gina Davis and uh, Lori, Lori Petty, Lori Petty. Yeah. Lori Petty. When they come in, who is it? Rosie or it's, Madonna? It's, it's Rosie O'Donnell. They're, they meet Rosie O'Donnell and Madonna, and they're two. The one the one sets of sisters, and then yeah. Madonna and and uh, and Rosie are best friends, and they're like the New Yorker tough girls. Yeah, yeah. And they have a little back and forth, and Rosie O'Donnell's like, "Yes, yeah, some of you are gonna be going home." And Rosie O'Donnell <laughs> takes a baseball, which I, I don't know. I assume you've never played any sport ever, but a baseball is very hard. <laughs> it's nicknamed hard ball. Yeah, And she takes the ball and she throws it as fast as she can from six feet away at Gina Davis. <laughs> and Gina Davis manages to catch it with her bare hand, which is absurd. <laughs> but if she didn't, the, the character, Rosie O'Donnell's character, would have fucking murdered Gina Davis. And, and then she catches it. So it's like, ah, it's all forgiven. We're best friends now. Well, to add to that, when she's like 90 or 70 or 80 and she comes back at the end rosie o'donnell does it again <laughs> and now she's like an old lady and she throws the ball <laughs> at this old lady's face and the old lady catches it again but it's like yeah she's she's a, uh, attempted murder twice on Cheetah davis yeah no it's because you can kill someone that way right isn't that like yeah, i uh, mean a baseball in the face i mean like probably i mean i'm gonna sound sexist here probably not a woman but I mean, a, a man. Bro, we're talking. We're not talking about one. We're talking about Rosie O'Donnell. I mean, that's like, <laughs> that's like a fucking. She's a beast. Well let, well, let me ask you this. Like, so in Bull Durham, not to get too much into it, but they have the part where you ask him to throw the ball at the mascot, and kind of similar to the mascot, it seems like he gets knocked unconscious, which is another trope in uh, movies where someone gets knocked unconscious and no one is concerned. But like right. that. But like, do you think that could have killed him, or do you think the mascot outfit is? enough to like protect 
Yeah, I think he has the big head. I believe someone have to fact check me on this. I believe the Miami Hurricane uh, mascot got shot one time. Somebody shot a gun at him and it missed him or whatever because it's a big giant yeah. head. But yeah, you shouldn't. I mean, just because you yeah, it's a big head, but you just shouldn't shoot him. No, like, they should have put one of those. They should put one of those on Kennedy. Kennedy should have a big fucking you know duck head on. Yeah, you want to survive? It's not fucking uh, armor. Yeah, it will go. Th- but it, yeah. Um, yeah, you're right though. She is trying to kill her, and I, I think between that and the, th- I mean, I still think the point. I think poisoning someone is also just as crazy, right? Like, yeah. And there was a deleted scene where they fucked her. They they ate her out. <laughs> That's on the, That's on the TV extras. <laughs> well, Tom Tom Hanks is like fucking sexually harassing that old hag the whole time. She's like smacking her in the ass and kissing her and then calling her ugly and like he's going to town on her. <laughs> the old lady. <laughs> I love doing Wither of Oz. Great line. (laughs) Going to town. Yeah, so... The movie is hilarious, by the way. I just want to say, like, I did not... The movie is funnier. A lot of movies, like, a lot of movies you think are hilarious as a kid, and then we bring them up, and it's just like, you know, someone giving a middle finger or, like, farting, and you you still think it's comedic genius or whatever. But this movie is actually much funnier as an adult because there is amazing... Like, there is some great, hilarious lines in it. Yeah, well, I've always said since I was a kid, one of the hardest I've ever laughed. I remember me and my yes. Uncle Dale watching it. <laughs> and the great moment early on in the film, I forget the woman's name. You just watched it today, probably. But the, the Marla, big, the, the great, great ugly, ugly woman. Mar- yeah, Marla. <laughs> she's hitting balls. They're indoor. They're, she's just hitting bombs everywhere. John Lovitz is the talent scout. And he goes to meet her and she pulls her hair back and he goes, yee. And um, he does like a Lovitz jump back. He makes the he- thing. Here's how here's how amazing it is. Uh, it's 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 not just that he goes he does a double take right in front of her, which is the meanest thing of all it's time. Like, to, to just be like he does two double takes. He goes, right. Ugh. he looks again, does another double take, Ugh. and then he goes, "We'll let you know." <laughs> like it's like the perfect joke structure for him to do two double takes. It's it's one of the funniest things I've ever seen. I don't. I don't remember that part, but I brought it up to other people and they all like immediately remember that scene. as like one of the funniest scenes. Yeah, it's a memorable scene. It's amazing, though, to think how politically correct would become that a movie as as silly and um, cheesy and sentimental as A League of Their Own is like you could never get away with all of it. Like t- uh, Tom Hanks it's so much completely. Out. <laughs> it's so much. Well, first of all, it's just so much ugly humor. Like right. it's so much humor about people being ugly. Like Rosie O'Donnell has the picture of her ugly husband and they're like, is that out of focus? And she's like, no, why? <laughs> and then there's just like, I love you, Wither of Oz and Rosie O'Donnell, like Rosie O'Donnell's excited because the reporter's coming and Madonna just looks to her and goes, don't hold your breath. Like, it's just so much like humor about being ugly and, and it's hilarious. And because it's a family friendly movie, it's funnier now in a way, I think, because it feels really shocking. Like, because you don't expect it. Right, right. Yeah, no, there's a lot of stuff like that. And like you said, uh, the the drugging and then, I mean, just Tom Hanks slapping asses and being in the locker room and all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, John Lovitz in the beginning is like so like a tour de force. He, for the first 20 minutes, I was just hysterical because of him. I mean, every line he says is like amazing. Like, yeah. I, I can't remember all of them, but I feel like when the sister, do you know it? Do you know every line pretty well? Not as much in that one. The other two movies, I can really. I feel like when he down. goes into, the, I tried to write them down, but when he goes into the farmhouse, the sister's like, can I, can I come and play? And he's just really mean and says something hilarious. Like, yeah, yeah. <clears> of course. I don't know. But then the, the line when they finally come and he's like, did you promise the cows you'd ride home? <laughs> <laughs> like, he's just so. And then there's another line that's amazing where the f- ugly girl, is, the Marla is waiting and she won't come into the train. And he's like, the train's the one that moves, not the platform. You're like, <laughs> like, I don't know. There's just some great fucking lines with him. Yeah, no, he has, he's great. And, and, and Hanks uh, to me, like steals the show. You hate to be like, it's a women, it's a movie about women and it's filled with women. And then be like, Tom Hanks is the best. He steals the show, but he really does to me. Well, the problem with League of Their Own is all the funny parts are kind of from the men. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, I'm just observing a pattern. Like to it's me, the life. funny, <laughs> to me, the funniest parts are like John Lovitz. And one of the f- hilarious parts is that little kid, that kid who drives Gina Davis to the party. And he's right. like, how about you go in the back seat with me and make a man out of me, which is just a <laughs> hilarious line. And then she's like, how about I slap you around for saying that? And he's like, why can't it be both? (laughs) (laughs) 
like they they get they have a lot yeah i don't know if the women are that they don't give them that i mean i guess rosie o'donnell has a couple but her new york accent's so over the top it kind of it's hard to laugh at yeah her her humor that she gets is throws baseball at face of star (laughs) um, but there's 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 funny moments from them as well and but but hanks is just uh fantastic i I think Um, hanks is good i will say this i think he's really good um, I do wonder if like an actor who's just more of naturally a degenerate could have been funnier, like a, you know, like a Walter Matthau in Bad News Bears. So, because I feel like you see him acting like a degenerate, but you know, he's just so good hearted, you know? Right, right, right. So I, I do wonder if like a more degenerate kind of actor, because I, I think Tom Hanks is a great actor, but you still see him like trying to become that part when you yeah. know, you know, and he gets the sentimentality more correctly or the warmth more than I think the vulgarity, you know? No, he nails it. I mean, the awesome, avoid the clap. Jimmy Dugan is one of my favorite lines ever. It's a great line. He has I some great lines. But, but, but that's good advice. <laughs> but don't you think it would have been a little funnier if you had like Walter, you know, I don't know, Walter Matthau saying it or someone who's just like, uh, just a little bit more of a degenerate. Maybe it's from my knowledge of, maybe he hadn't done as many wholesome films by then, you know? And it's my knowledge of his wholesome films later, but you do see him almost like trying to become a degenerate instead of it coming naturally out of him. Cause yeah. he's just such a good natured, he has such a good natured vibe, you know? I don't know. I never thought of it really. I think it's such a brilliant comedic performance. I think he's great with the limps and he's just dirty and weird. And also, like you said, the sent- sentimental moments, he's so great. I mean, the, when he rips the letter from the guy, which that guy's a little over the top, obviously, the guy delivering the letter. The <laughs> that part, I mean, oh, like oh where's the letter? Where's yeah. the letter? I hate telling these people their husbands died. Where is this letter? It's well, a little much. He, he's a little much, but I actually think the way Tom Hanks delivers the news is a little much. He takes the letter and he should just get it over with and just say the name. But instead, he slowly walks through them what? all, <laughs> like just building suspense until he gets right to the woman. It's like, just fucking say the name. I, I, I thought that was a, a little inconsiderate. He's got the limp. I think he's limping over there. And, you and that need one, to you move d- over. Just say, uh, it's for you. Just get it over with. They don't need the suspense. You do have to build the tension in that moment. <laughs> the movie, not him, not the, not the fucking guy in real life. I feel like he's the, building it a little. <laughs> the character, I mean, for the movie, you have to build the tension. I understand that it's a little... Because here's the thing, like one person knows, but the, I know you got to build it for the movie. But if you actually did that, people would be really mad at you. Like if you actually like had the letter and just slowly walked, like, cause everyone also gets to know that their husband didn't die. So you want to get that news out pretty quickly, you know? Right, right. But the moment right after, I mean, it's overly sentimental, but the sentimental moments, it came on the other day. I, I got some family shit going on. It came on the other day on TV randomly and and just the last moment with with Kit and and Gina Davis and she's and Gina Davis is like you played great and then uh, uh, Lloyd Petty goes like you I fucking started crying I'm out here I'm like, it just immediately <laughs> hits me I'm I'm crying and also as we've talked about before I think I sent it to you and Steve Rogers and I, I sent it to people periodically the 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 moment where he's talking to her when Gina Davis is gonna quit because her dumb Bill Pullman husband comes home. And he says it, it's supposed to be hard. If it wasn't hard, everyone would do it. The hard is what makes it great. That part is great. I love that is, speech. Is as good as anything ever fucking written ever to me. It's like a, a Thoreau or Walt Whitman, whatever it is. I used yeah. to carry that in my wallet when I was younger, starting out in comedy. And it's a great, yeah, it's a great. It's beautiful. Line. He it's says a, it great too. He kind of just, he does that great actor thing where when you say something profound, you, you don't give that much to it. You just kind of say it in a way where you're like, kind of just saying it very naturally. It was, it was just very understated in that moment. It's a great moment. And that's the best relationship in the movie, actually, to me, is Hanks and Gina Davis. It's um, an interesting relationship. And there's just a little bit of sexual tension that they like don't fully go into, but it's there. But yeah. they, it's like such a tip of the iceberg with the sexual tension. Yeah, it's great. And then when he meets Pullman, he's kind of like, oh, hey, I'm a big fan. <laughs> yeah, they know each other. And it's great. And also the moment of uh, them after the game, when uh you know it's Lori Petty and Gina Davis again and she's like you will miss this I don't care what you say and it's great it's just beautiful I get like goosebumps thinking about it and it does remind me of comedy so much I think yeah I think there's some good stuff in it and I think I think there's a lot I think yeah I found it very funny I th- I'd say character issues with the movie that I had I feel like it could have been a lot better I, I mean I think it yeah. was funny and I enjoyed it but I feel like 
one of the things that I kind of, I feel like they kind of gloss over Tom Hanks's like transformation. I feel like he's, he's like an a complete alcoholic, right? Who does yeah. nothing. Who's just like oblivious. And then one day he just wakes out, wakes up out of it. And right. just starts giving direction. And then the next scene, she's about to drink and Gina Davis just hands him a Coke. And that's it. He's done drinking. You know what I mean? I feel like they could have gone more into his transformation of from this drunken cynicism to like coaching them a little and then actually showing him get excited right. and kind of get alive again by the coaching. So I think they glossed over a lot of stuff with him in that sense. Well, the thing is, the there in the title is about the women. So I think uh, they didn't want to get well, too into his <laughs> I mean, you can do both. I mean, no, yeah, but... It, but you can't, you can't just have this full blown alcoholic and you just hand him a Coke one moment and he, that's it. I mean, it'd be yeah. nice if that's all you needed. You know, it'd be nice if, you know, for sobriety, you're just about to grab your alcohol that you've been dependent on for six years and <laughs> someone hands you a Coke bottle and you're good to go. But it would have been interesting. I think it would have been not interesting more to see a little bit of his like rejuvenation, you know? Yeah, yeah, him going and getting sober and having these moments. But I, I always liked him more when he is sober because he feels more real. And, and also, uh, another thing. what problem I'm saying is I'd rather Tom Hanks a movie about him getting sober than watching women play baseball. Yeah, oh, uh, no. 100%. <laughs> no. Uh, but another um, problematic moment is when uh, Gina Davis is trying to manage. And then he's like, no, no, you can't steal. She'll throw her out. And then he's right. And he's like, yeah, you dumb broad. You, women can't manage. <laughs> That's another one that would be problematic now. There's a couple. I mean, uh, well, he had a great line where he's like, quit thinking with your tits. <laughs> oh, it's so good. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, yeah, it is, it is interesting because it's a feminist movie at the time, but like, uh, I mean, I still think it's very feminist in the spirit, but like, yeah, there's some, there's just a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of ugly humor or kind of mean humor that probably wouldn't. That's the thing. Ugly humor is funny though. And, and also another thing is like, people get offended by the John Lovitz double take, right? Mm-hmm. But here's the thing, what makes John Lovett so funny, that moment, it's because he's also ugly. Right, right, of get, Like if he was good looking, that would have been really mean. It's so funny when an ugly person finds someone else ugly. Like I just, there's something hilarious about that. Yeah, that's that's the joke, of course. Yeah, exactly. And if they had Brad Pitt, it would have yeah, been, like, been what the fuck? But people would still get offended now. They'd be like, because John Lovett is a man and it's like, you know, patriarchy, but he's an ugly man. Right. And that's like it's it's also just funny being really mean and not caring about the other person. Of, I of course, and in front of her father also, who's, <laughs> who's so sweet, who's so sweet, and it's kind of like aware of it and doesn't take offense. He's like, "Yeah, I know she's ugly. I trained her." He's like, "I know she's ugly. I, I really trained her to." <laughs> he kind of acts like it was his fault, like his training made her ugly. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, it it's a it's a it's a beautiful film. There's a lot of really touching moments in there. And I thought I yeah, I thought the ending was so nothing it on a base level, it is it always feels sad. Like nothing makes you face mortality more for me than seeing like hot women be old, you know. Right. It's just like a sad like seeing Gina Davis at the end is, you know, and her old is sad. And I do remember when she sees as a kid, I remember being really sad when you see uh, on Tom uh, Hanks' sign where it says when he died. Right. I feel like that was one of my first like brushes with death in a movie watching that. And it was such a real sad, cause it's so small. It's just seeing that, that little, you know, word. And I felt like that was really powerful as a kid, that ending, you know? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I'm trying to think of my early brushes with death. I guess stand by me, the dead kid, but oh, yeah, um, yeah. great film. Also, um, I watch it live, so I guess that kid being ripped in half. <laughs> <laughs> but this was re this felt real you know what i mean it, it was a real thing where you like most times when someone dies you just you don't see them die you just read about it right right right. that's how we get most death we just read it so like it was and, like a very real moment and thank god by the way it would suck if we had to see <laughs> everybody to see die everyone. <laughs> They're like, and here's the moment, and it just cuts to John Prime. And, <laughs> and you're like, geez. I mean, some of them would be fun. Um, I but, guess uh, so. Yeah, I can name a few. Yeah. Kennedy, we saw yeah. die. I mean, you can see the video. Fucking Kennedy not, saw not die. Years and, later. and even crazier, not to go on a tangent, but like, kind of like Storm, you know how like Storming the Capitol, like for me, like we watched, I was watching the news already. Like, it's so crazy when something crazy happened when you're already watching the news and then right, something right. crazy happened. The craziest is Ruby. People are watching the news. They just see Oswald on TV being moved to another jail cell and they see a guy come out and shoot him on TV. 
Yeah. That had to be the craziest thing anyone ever saw on TV. Yeah, I think that's probably the most insane moment in the history of television. My Letterman debut is up there, but <laughs> I mean, that has to be it. The number one and also great moment in the movie that you hate, JFK, where Michael Rooker, who I love, has one of the great deliveries of a line ever where Jack Ruby shoots Oswald and then it cuts to Michael Rooker and he goes, this is crazy. <laughs> and it's a fucking amazing delivery. Everyone go check out JFK. It's about 15 minutes in. If, if that, Great yeah, delivery. Is that the only movie where he doesn't play a racist person, Michael Rooker? I mean, I he might like be racist, racist in that movie, too. Well, I don't he works for like a liberal, uh, what was it, DA or whatever? Um, DA, yeah. But uh, yeah, no, it's so yeah, that Tom Hanks moment is just kind of like, I always, there's, did that not affect you? There's just something very sad about it. No, no, it's sad. I mean, it, there's a lot of really sad moments. The one thing about that movie is it does linger for quite a while. Like, like the movie, the baseball, there's the final baseball scene, and then there's them talking on the bus, and then they well, come in the future. It's most, they, here's a problem, I think, with the end in that, because I do think it's moving just on a base level of, like, people getting older, but it could have been a lot more moving. What happens is it's repetitive, because the problem is they already resolved, uh, Gina Davis and Lori Petty already resolved issues, and then it goes to the to the present time. Right. So everything after that is just sentimentality. What would have been interesting is if they didn't resolve issues in the pre in the past, and it gets resolved when she sees her at the uh, museum. Right. Right. Like, but in, but they don't do that. So it's just like it's like emotionally flat. You're just watching resolution after resolution after resolution. You know. Yeah. And then the fat kid from Teen Wolf comes in. He yeah. he plays the guy and. It's uh, a little corny, yeah. 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 A it's a corny, corny thing, but it has but hilarious jokes. There's some great punch up. Whatever funny guy wrote like punch up to that screenplay. Uh or woman. Play. Uh well, I assume actually it wasn't. Well, it, men wrote the script, right? But uh but Penny Marshall directed it. Penny Marshall directed it, yeah. She might have wrote something too. We probably better film people would have looked into that before. Uh, <laughs> but the next but, movie, <clears throat> yeah. I know who wrote. Wait, should we do maybe we should do Feel the Dream second so we could come back together with Bull Durham? Yeah, let's do I'm that. I'm assuming be like a, you like Bull Durham. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Field of Dreams is so unbelievably stupid. I, I'm already upset. <laughs> I don't I don't know if I'm good. Like, do people love this movie? People love the movie. First of all, I'm going to say this, and it's going to be hurtful, but that's you're already hurting my feelings by not thinking this movie. Sport, because I'm not into, like, because my I don't care about, like, my dad playing catch with me or something. Yeah, you don't. You're not a, a sports guy. Um, and I was going to say Jew, but Jews love baseball more than anybody. So Jews love baseball, but I don't think they're big onto the father-son catch. I don't think I, that's a Jewish thing. Yeah, I don't think. Well, Jews don't play baseball. They just like the numbers, I think. I think they're just like, <laughs> you get 300. They like the stats. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 287 over the course of yeah. three seasons. But uh, something's wrong with you. Maybe you have a great, you either have a, a great relationship with your dad or no relationship with your dad or something's up with you or there's no spirit to you. There's no magic to you. I, I mean, there's magic in the moonlight. What's, up, here. what's I mean, up with me is that this movie is completely pandering and you saw it when you were younger and it made an effect on you, which I'm saying is valid. But as an adult, if you saw this movie, you would be like, this is the stupidest piece of shit in the world. Or maybe not. But but I'm just going to go on that because it is so, first of all, none of it makes any sense on any level. Like one of the things I found so ridiculous is the wife, the wife, so her first reaction is, he goes, I want to destroy the farm and build a baseball field, right? No, that's not her first reaction. Well, no, Kevin Costner says that to her. He's like, someone told me to, I heard a voice and they told me to like, you know, build a baseball field. And she goes, well, it's crazy, but go for it, right? Which is already weird, right? But well, whatever, she's kooky. I, I just want to, I gotta kooky. interrupt. You're 20 minutes into the movie. A lot of stuff happens before that. He thinks he's going crazy. Maybe it's an acid flashback. Maybe it's, yeah, a flash it's pretty forward. quick where he goes into it. Like he's pretty, he's, he's building that baseball field by minute, like 10 minutes in. May, maybe 10 minutes, but he does the whole introduction, but a lot happens before then. It's not the initial reaction, but it's just a couple minutes in. Fine, but just as an example of something that's just insane. She says for him, she's like, okay, do it. He does it. They're now going bankrupt, right? She's still kind of okay with it. And then they, she comes out and sees that there are ghosts, right? Yep. She sees that there is a spiritual world, which none of them are that, I mean, they're a little surprised, but not that surprised. But they see that there's a spiritual world. Their whole view of everything has changed, right? And then he has a dream that he has to go get a rider and she's like, you've gone too far. How the fuck has he gone too far when she's seen the ghosts 
playing baseball, whatever vision he has after that, she should support. She should have supported him in the beginning when he's being crazy. But now that she's seen him, she's like, you know what? You've gone too far. It, it makes no sense. And then she's thinking of selling the farm. It's like, what? <laughs> like, like her whole, she's seen ghosts on a field. She would do what he wants. I guess. I mean, that's a really, really nitpicking there. I mean, eventually, it's just like human behavior. Eventually, she does go along, obviously, because she had the same dream. And the reason she supports him is because they're hippies. They're believers in this free spirit. And doing he should not things. need the same identical dream. She should. She already has what she needs. Fucking ghosts of baseball players playing on the field. She doesn't need to have the same dream well, for him to like go out. I would say this also. So they're raising a child and you got to work. So the other thing, the building the baseball field didn't involve him being gone right. for days. So this one is a little more like, wait, you're going to leave me alone here with the, with the kid for days. It's, but so, well, I it's, go back it's to the crazy. spiritual world is communicating to him and she has proof of it. So it's just a crazy thing. I, it just doesn't, no, well, none of the behavior in this movie seems like, real on any level and then i guess it's my about big ghost you dumb dumb it's about well, ghosts but see, even magical things need to have the logic within the magic within the magic it needs to have some kind of logic even within it like i'm not against ghosts but the reactions need to have some believability everything she says is is every reaction she has is wrong like each one is not believable and i think ultimately my big problem is i think there's a real problem that the whole family sees the ghost i think that's the core problem because the whole family sees the ghosts, there's kind of no conflicts in this movie. I know they're trying to sell the farm, but there's really not. They're just kind of in support of him. It would have been more interesting if he just saw it and you, and, and you had this tension of, is he crazy or is he not? But that tension goes away so quickly in the movie that you're left without any real like tension, real conflict. Well, that's because it's the value of family. He's he is in a wonderful relationship and he's a great father. And so they all believe in and see the magic together, which is something that lacked in his life because of his relationship with his father and but lack just, of mother. I, I guess I think movies need to be conflicts. And here you're just watching. You're not really watching conflicts. You're just watching a family seeing ghosts together. And then and then also <laughs> like also like to me, structurally, it's so bad, like, you know, when you write a screenplay, I think a big thing is you want to make sure to not see the writer's hand, right? You want to make sure not to have these contrived moments where you're like, oh, that's the writer just doing it, you know? Even in a ghost thing, right? And in this movie, it is so lazily written, the plot, I guess it's from the book, where the, the writer is essentially just a spirit, is constantly just telling him what to do. And he goes, they're not even clues. Like even the part where he's like, they're talking about the Terrence Mann book at the PTA, right? Yes. Yes. I thought at least there, he's writing something down on a piece of paper. I thought at least there'd be an anagram where you have to do something, you know what I mean? To figure it out. But even that is just like, oh no, I think I should be doing this now. Like it's just a spirit tells him and he does it. There's no clues. But, there's no like, there's no obstacles. He's just fucking doing what the spirit tells him. But what like, I think is you don't understand. And, and by the nature of your comments makes me think you don't understand. He got, he gets everything wrong. It How says, does he get if everything you build wrong? It, he will come. So he thinks if I build the field, Shoeless Joe Jackson will come. Incorrect. If if I if I I gotta do this. How's that incorrect? That's what happens. You mean because he being the father? Yeah, the but it's father the is who comes, not but Shoeless Joe. And well, then Shoeless says, Joe does come. Ease his he pain. He comes first. Shoeless he, come first. Right. He thinks if I ease his pain, he means oh, he means Terrence Mann. No, he means his father. I know, but it's like, you're just throwing things in the mood. There's no like, it, I, I guess it's just like, to me, it's just easily easy, easy to write a movie where just telling someone to do something and, and then you have that moment at the end. I mean, it's obviously all about his father. I don't know, I, I so, found it like so pandering and but, it's all about this like American nostalgia. We gotta come back, we gotta go backwards, sorry. So what? they're saying he's getting the message, ease his pain. And he's I got it. I got, I'm not, I got it. <laughs> and then the reason he thinks Terrence Mann is because he happens to go to a PTA meeting where they're talking about Terrence Mann. So he's like, oh, yeah, this is another but, sign, which he's incorrect about. He's not fully incorrect Ter no, Terrence because Terrence Mann is Terrence part Mann, of the plot. He's part of the he's part of that thing that need is needed here. Because Terrence Mann believes also, because he also has the spirit of the 60s. Right. It's about so the, the spirit, man. That's what I'm saying. So that he is part of the whole thing. 
he, he ends up being part of it. He was part of it from the beginning. He's he's a 60s writer who has no more passion. And he needs to go back. He's part of it. That's why his father's name is in the story. It's of course, of nonsense. course. No connected. mistakes. It's all just a tapestry. But of it's like, make it like a little like more difficult. And then it's like, what is, when he goes into that, when he's go to the, the doc is dead. And then suddenly he's back in the seventies with the ghost. I don't, I'm, I'm just confused by the rules of any of this. There's no, even if you're making a mat, a movie of magic and, and I'm sure all the comments are going to be like, you don't, you're taking it too seriously. Even in the world of magical realism, you still have to create rules in it that make some kind of sense. He's just back in the seventies was doc Graham. Like, like that town is just suddenly, uh, that part is so confusing to me. It's such a, it's a beautiful moment. And he just goes along with it. Cause it's, it's fucking magic, man. It's I mean, so trite. And the, the doctor who gave it all up to be a, it's all just wholesome nonsense. It's just like not real. Well, that's a true story. That part, the doctor, Dr. Well, Moonlight. Well, I thought you were going to tell me the movie's true. <laughs> um, no, Moonlight. It's hilarious if you're like, that real. movie's true. You know, this all happened. Um, <laughs> Yeah, what, well, I get, right, let's, what do you love? Let, I, I don't want to just be like fine because I know this means a lot to you. What is it about it? Because obviously people love this movie and I'm watching it and I'm like, this is nonsense. It's so pandering to this like American nostalgia to the point where it feels like a spoof. Uh, it's so contrived and corny and there's no conflicts. But what is it? I don't want to just shit on Like, what is it? I don't what is it that makes it so appealing? Who is it pandering to? I don't understand that. It's pandering to people's sense of like this kind of wholesome pastime nostalgia. Like this idea of like things used to be great and we can go back to that time. You know what I mean? It, it, it panders to that sense of like wholesomeness that just isn't a real thing, I guess. Well, it's to me, it's about... Um the spirit of, of belief and believing in, in magic and reconciliation and um, redemption and, and all those wonderful things. But well, it's, what it's not I a love challenge about it, to believe if you hear a voice and then you build it and then the ghosts come. I mean, it would have been a challenge if no one else saw it. That would take faith, but the family sees it. And I do think that's a big problem. The fact that the family sees it right away makes it kind of like, all right, it's real. Because they believe in him because they're they're a loving family. But it takes away conflict. The movie needs to be conflict, not just everyone getting along. So much <laughs> conflict in the movie. I mean, that, that, that's just insane to say there's no conflict. What I love about the movie, first of all, the score is amazing. The music score is, is good. amazing. The score is good. That, you I could think, just stop there. The I score think, is good. I think all the acting is just pitch perfect. And obviously there are things that, I mean... I love baseball. Baseball is one of the great loves of my life. And I did have a, a uh, I don't know how to complicated relationship with my father yeah, and course, baseball, yeah. obviously. but you can't just put it at that. That, that may, is what makes it in my top 10 movies of all time. And, and my favorite movie for many years of my life and still top three favorite movies of my life, but that's not what makes it a great movie. That's what makes it so special to me. Yes. and so amazing to me. But um, that's not what made it a Best Picture nominee. And our friend Roger Ebert giving it four out of four stars. I, um, I'm glad he's dead now, honestly. That <laughs> um, makes it all the rest of it nonsense. So, I mean, first of all, I think all the acting is just pitch perfect. It's just beautiful. There's so many great moments in there. I mean, when they're driving in the van, they're like, I don't know what we came here all the way to Chisholm for. And then they pick up a kid and it's, <laughs> and it's him. I mean, that's such a great moment. It's but so it's like, serious. It's There's great hand- jokes in it. It's, it's hilarious. All, it's all handed to him. Like, like it's clearly real. He knows it's real. So like, of course, what they're doing is value. That's, that's my issue. It's like, it's not like the thing where like, oh, I'm crazy. Clearly he's not crazy. His family saw it. They both saw it on there. It's not a test of faith because it's like clearly like, it's like clearly obviously a real thing because it's confirmed by so many people. Because it's interesting they bring up the Jimmy Stewart movie, Harvey in it. Right. Which is about it. Are you really angry at me right now? <laughs> no, no. I, I, I feel sad for you. <laughs> well, it's just, I just, I, I don't like, to me, it's not a like, it's easy to say like it's about believing in magic, but it's right there. Like it, it, it's obvious that it's real. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. It doesn't seem like a big challenge or a big leap because the whole family saw it. And I don't understand what, what is, I guess I just, it all seems so pointless to me. Like what, like what, what actually is happening? Like explain it to me from an actual like logistical perspective. What actually is happening in this movie? Well, 
I mean, it's hard to explain because, like, the question is so nonsensical, and I feel like you're being uh, obtuse. What is happening? Nothing happens. <laughs> Trying to pull like, a Shawshank Redemption insult on me? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just. Well, what it's, I know, it's such I'm, a strange thing of like what happened. I mean, so much happens. But there's but there's logic to other things that involve ghosts. Like, someone is speaking to Kevin Costner to bring back these baseball players. So these baseball players, we don't know who that is. I guess that's the mystery, right? Yeah. So these baseball baseball players just chill in on his field and they're just playing games. There's no like mission. They're just there to play games. Right. They're just there to like practice. Well, they got banned from baseball and so right, now there's right. a place to play baseball. Right. But they're ghosts. Certainly. And they're just they're just playing on this field. Um, but they're not there's no like mission there. They're just playing. But then but it's all there just to have him play catch with his father again. Yeah, well, the movie again is about dreams and redemptions and um, and 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 connecting with people that. You... And that's fine, but it's all abstract. There's no real. There's not like a real thing with his father that they develop. It's just like a line. It's all like there's not a real like none of life is in this movie. It's all just pure. Fan I, I'm okay with things being fantastical, but like none of life is in it. You know. I, I, I don't know. The I mean, nitty gritty, the, the, the raw stuff, you know? I, I don't know what you mean. I mean, first of all, it's a father and son that stopped talking to each other, have uh, a estranged relationship, but you and don't they know reconnect. The, yeah, you don't know the father in the movie. It's not talked about. So it's like... It's, they talk it, about him quite a bit. No, it's like, you don't know the character. It's like, it's like, it's just like... Uh, I mean, if they had flashbacks with the father, is there some relationship, you know? They introduce it in the beginning. They introduce it in the beginning and throughout. I don't... That's... I mean, they introduce... But you don't know the... They have one line in the beginning and one line near the end. That's pretty much it. It's not like when the father comes in, you're like, oh, finally, this relationship we've watched this whole time. You know what I mean? It's purely a... It's purely a, a universal image without anything specific to it. There's no real... All you know is that... And by the way, this is the conservative part of the movie. All you know is that... He read a counterculture book, which is another thing is weird that he seems to not really know Terrence Mann that well as a writer in the beginning. What? Well, she seems to know it. He seems to be kind of oblivious and then get really into him. And then he mentioned at the end, it was a Terrence Mann book he read that made him hate his father. Do you remember that part? Yes, the boat rocker. Yeah, they got in a fight yeah, about it. It's a little bizarre because it's just like, I don't know, he doesn't seem like, really i don't know it just it, he didn't seem connected to terrence Mann the whole time and then he mentioned that at the end but anyway that's kind of like no. he read this book and it made him fall it's kind of like saying the, i feel like a big message of the movie is that you're con you shouldn't your conservative father was not wrong and you shouldn't uh yell at him so no, he <laughs> loves terrence Mann too i don't i don't understand what you're talking about he loves terrence Mann too and the part about the book breaking up him and his father that was a joke to fuck with Terrence Mann. He says, why uh, when you were 14? He says, that's when I read The Boat Rocker. And he's like, I'm kidding. And what really happened was he said, I can never trust a, uh, a guy whose hero was a criminal. That right, was right, right, right. He was like busting oh, his balls. Yeah, right. And he was a huge fan of Terrence Mann. He was just not as outspoken about it because he was sitting there thinking in his head. Right. I thought he does say I'm kidding. Like, I'm not blaming you. But I thought he was saying that that really did happen. I mean, I think it happened. He was like, I'm kidding, why. but I did read the Terrence Mann book and that made me like angry at my father. I think right. that's real. I, by the way, I think Terrence Mann is, is supposed to be mirroring J.D. Salinger. People say that, but it's not really J.D. Sal I mean, I feel like it's more like, uh, I mean, J.D. Salinger didn't write these like necessarily like counterculture books. I don't know. Well, first of all, he's black. Well, I think in the, I believe in the, in the book. Well, I mean, it's also like casting is involved. Also. They're not going to get it. I thought it was like, it seemed like more like James Baldwin. I, I, they're like, everyone said J.D. Salinger. I'm like, J.D. Salinger wasn't like, you don't write these countercultural books that will like, uh, and, and talk about like civil rights movement and shit. I think in the book, I could be wrong. I think in the book, it was J.D. Salinger. Was it? I could be wrong about that. Yeah, well, they flipped it a little because he's definitely a more politically conscious guy. Like J.D. Salinger was like a reckless, like, like this guy was like an activist writer, which J.D. Salinger was certainly not. Um, right, but then he became a recluse. Yeah, I guess the, the, the reclusive part is, I guess, at the end. Um, what is that Crown Heights? Was all the Jews and the Blacks? What? Because he goes to see him and it's like, oh, no, that's in Jews. Boston. They're in Boston. Oh. I, I don't even think you, I don't even, like, the fact that you think they went to New York is just mind blowing to me. 
Oh, yeah, they're down. Yeah, they're in Crown Dodgers. Heights. That's where Fenway Park I, is. I don't know baseball stadiums. I don't know which one. That's the. But I thought they're going to see the Dodgers. No, it was the Red Sox A's. Oh, I mean, right. <laughs> I mean, this is a movie I, I, I've seen I, legitimately. This is the same. Movie I got the I've movie. I just didn't. I just life. don't know. I don't know baseball, so I didn't. I got confused. It looked like the Dodgers. <laughs> I mean, the idea of this movie taking place in Los Angeles is just insane. <laughs> and and the, the take of conservatism having anything to do with this movie is so bad. Honestly, like, you're not offending me. You're just dumb. You don't know baseball. You have no dad, whatever. It is but conservative idea, values. It's, it's like, it's. No, the, it doesn't. Me, it doesn't. I don't mean conservative like necessarily like like a hardline republican value i don't mean that i mean conservative values in the sense of like this nostalgia for the past being better and trying to conserve those values that's what i mean by that it's not even a nostalgia for the past being better it's showing like the 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 60s that that person and the father they should come together and just reminisce about how the past was great which it wasn't that's that's like nostalgia and a bit of a lie, but like they're like trying to show how we can both believe in this lie, you know what I mean? But it definitely makes the sixties look as like uh like him kind of being juvenile, yelling at his father, not talking to him, you know? I mean, I'm so like lost for words with some of how bad these these takes are. I'd rather hear about how Home Alone led to fucking Columbine. <laughs> I'm so- I'm really I'm not like this is how like I'm I'm honestly surprised. That like you know you have a great taste you're a smart guy I'm surprised like this movie I mean I guess it's connected to your childhood but like this movie makes no sense isn't about like real things and, and yeah, that doesn't mean it can't a movie can be about ghosts and be about real things but it's all just promoting this mindless nostalgia it's all There's, pandering to sentimentality it's I mean that's the insane. baseball speech it's, was James Earl Jones it's just like one of the great it, monologues in history but and, and it feels like a speech movie. you'd see an animatronic say outside of a baseball museum. That's honestly what it felt. And by the way, the lines they give Ray Liotta are so terrible, like are so awkwardly bad in the beginning. I mean, he does a good job, but like when he's just like saying, ah, the cool of the grass, anytime you have to describe grass and dialogue, it's just like the hardest things you can say. That's because you're a fucking, you're a a Jew that's never been on grass. I mean, I don't think you, I can't. Ah, the cool of the grass. That's what I miss. The cool of the grass, the smell. I don't know. It's just, you don't think your dialogue's cheesy at the beginning? If it was about, you know, pens and calculators, you'd be all over it. (laughs) Really? They give him like some of the hard, like they give him some really hard lines to say. I well, wish I could bring a clip up because that, in that I, begin- I know every line. What line do you want? He says the, oh, the, the cool of the grass. Yeah, right. Read the the say, grass. Yeah, say that whole speech because Kevin Costner's like, do you, what does he say? He says, do you miss it? Or brass what? batoons in the hallway, brass beds in the bedroom. The, oh, the beginning. The beginning about the grass. Tr- What's the beginning? The, he says, the thrill of the grass, the cool of the grass. <laughs> you ever hold a ball or a glove to your face? He says that. Um, it sounds like lines in a, it, like there's a Louisville Slugger Museum in Louisville. It sounds like lines that animatronic would say at Louisville Slugger okay, Museum. Okay, imagine, <laughs> imagine you're not able to do comedy. I mean, the world would be thrilled, but imagine <laughs> your feeling if you couldn't do stand up for 70 years and then you walked into whatever bullshit club you work in Kentucky. Wouldn't you go, oh, the feeling of the mic in my hand, the smell of the no. on the couch? <laughs> no. That's I, because you're heartless. That's why you don't like the movie. You have no uh, sentimentality. That, 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 that sound in the room right where you <laughs> I feel that, that way. That feedback of the microphone. <laughs> this is the difference is I'm sentimental and, and you're not. I'm connected to these things. And the movie, by the way, is about a father and son and, and the difficulty of a father and son relationship. And well, it's similarly- not because that's not in the movie. I mean, they talk about it. It's not actually, you don't see anything with the father and son. It, you do oh, at the it, end. The, the, at it's the called end, the climax but, in film. Yeah, but, but, but it's an abstract concept. You don't know, like, he's just throwing a ball with the younger father. That's not like a real relationship you're seeing on screen. He introduces him to his granddaughter. And then the moment, the dialogue that I'm sure you hate because you're, you're just a heartless, mean person. I think you might be a conservative. <laughs> but... The, the moment where he says, is this heaven? And he says, no, this is Iowa. And, he's, and then he asks his dead father, is there a heaven? Now, this is a son asking a father the biggest question, the most important question in your life. Is there an afterlife? And he says, oh, yes, it's the place where dreams come true. And then he looks around. He looks at his father. He looks at his wife and child laughing and has this moment of connection with his whole family, including his dad, for the first time. And he says, maybe this is heaven. That I shit mean, you put on a coffee mug. That's as good as filmmaking gets. <laughs> that's up that's there shit with George you put on Bailey. a pillow. <laughs> no, it's not. George Bailey, there's like 
suffering and like real issues and like suicidal shit. That's coffee mug shit. No, like the this whole is, this. It's and he already crisis. Made, Okay, we got to wrap up. It is midlife move. crisis, I'm and it definitely mad. feels like he's really, it's like he created a man cave. It's like a, a man wrote, a, it's like every dad came together to write a script, and the script is ultimately about a man creating his own man cave and his whole family being in support of it. That's really what the allegory is. Okay, so here's a point that you'll love this because it's about fucking politics and bullshit. So the movie, so Kevin Costner's character Ray Kinsella is from the 60s, the idealism yeah. of the 60s, of yes. we're going to change everything. They're trying acid. They're playing it. They, he marched. I tried to like sitar music and I met him. He fell in love. And now he's into the Reagan 80s. Yeah. None of it has happened. Now it's it's Reagan. They're going broke like so many fucking people in middle America that Reagan was supposed to do good for. And yeah. now it's all coming apart. He's going to be foreclosed on. And he's having this midlife crisis of I never took any chances. Remember that spirit of the 60s we had when we all were going to change the world with free love. And here I am just living this mundane life. I don't like it. It's the same every day. And I don't. And, and he's Except still reeling really from a r- lack of relationship with his father. So he takes a huge chance, believes in magic, like the spirit of the 60s, not some concern. It's not Goldwater. It's not the spirit of the 60s because he's not trying to change the world. He's just trying to like live in this fantasy of, of, of cornfields and, and baseball, what it means. He's not actually, it's not the spirit of the 60s. It's he's, a conservative spirit of believing in some kind no. of myth. He's it's, trying he's to right a wrong. Him. He's trying to right several wrongs. And that is the spirit of the 60s. I think the spirit of the 60s is waking up, not going back to sleep. Like, and like throwing, finally getting to catch a ball with your dad is like, I don't know. To me, I want to see a movie about a character who doesn't get a chance to do that and how they live and how they cope with that. To me, it's just like all, I guess, I look, we come from a very different place. You, You like sentiment and I don't, and this is the ultimate sentimental movie, right? So that's where we're at. I mean, this movie- I mean, A League of Their Own is more sentimental than this movie. We are the all American food, but absolutely not. This man's movie is one of the most sentimental movies. This is more sentimental than any chick flick. This is more sentimental than any chick flick. I truly think this is one of the most sentimental movies ever. And uh, I don't know, to me, sentiment is like an enemy of art because it just makes you believe in like things that aren't real and it kind of numbs you to sleep instead of seeing the reality of things. I'm I'm not saying there's beautiful things in life, but I just, I, I don't know, nothing's felt earned in this movie. It was all about. There's no suffering to go with the, the um, the moment. You know, it was 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 fucking uh, Bailey. I mean, that's life. That's that's suffering, and then and learning appreciation and gratitude. I mean, it's sentimental too, but it's there's suffering in this. It's just to me, it's the whole thing is just, yeah, just like kind of sentiment the whole time, and it's easy sentiment. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, there is there is suffering in being a 38 year old man and feeling like your life is meaningless and mundane and desperately wanting uh, approval and relationship with your father who's passed. That's suffering. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't think they go into that enough. Um, but yeah, That's you know, fair. You know you, am I going to get attacked? Well, if anyone for the comments, I, I'm not going to read them, but uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to send them to you. I'm going to screenshot them and send them to you. <laughs> If anyone supports me, please post that in the comments because I cannot be the only one who thinks this. No, I'm sure somebody fucking. But I'll tell you what, they're gonna they're gonna be conservatives. They're gonna be right wing fucking nuts that are like fucking fuck you. <laughs> I hate hippies and whatever. I, the the conservative take is really silly. I mean, it's silly. I don't know. I it's to me it's it's sentimentalizing the '60s and kind of in a way taking away its spirit, which I think is the ultimate conservative. You know, but uh. But yeah, so anyway, I like Bull Durham. We, we gotta move on to Bull Durham. We gotta go to Bull Durham. Do you hate which, me? Are you, do you hate me? No, I like you very much. <laughs> I think, I, I mean, I, I would have said love before this. I feel, <laughs> most definitely, I feel that um, <laughs> it makes me feel sad that you got nothing from this. And, and I mean, you like the score, which is a masterful score uh, by, by Hans Zimmer, I believe. I need the, Bob I need, Horner, actually. I, James Horner? No. James Bob. Horner. I need the I need the I need the 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 sour to go so sweet. It's just all sweetness. And by the way, for other people comment saying I'm I'm heartless inside, I guarantee you I've cried at way more movies than you have. I've cried at so many movies. It's actually an issue. I don't cry in real life. They I don't cry like only in movies. What? You don't like those comments because you're you're telling them how you feel. You're 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 expressing 
uh, superiority to these folks, the, the common folks. Well, no, I'm just saying people are like, they're going to, they're expressing, they're boxing me in as like a heartless person. I'm just letting you know, like I cry at movies, good movies. Which, <laughs> what's the most <laughs> recent cry you've had in a movie? You want to do, okay, most recent cry, but then let's, you also do like our top five movies we cried the most at. Sure. I did this. Uh, all right. So my most recent cry was, I think, well, it, it was a while. It was, well, it was rewatching Nashville. Okay. Okay. Um, the ending of Nashville gets me every time, you know what I mean? But, uh, but my big, my top five cries, I mentioned this with someone the other day. My top five cries are Roma. Do you see Roma? Yeah. Like it? Liked it very much. Yes. Roma, I watched in theaters and I cried like at the end. And mm -hmm. then I rewatched kind of like when you like, you know how you watch a movie and you already know what's going to happen. I swear to God, I cried the entire movie. Wow. The entire movie. <laughs> like the whole movie, I was just crying. Yeah, you're unwell. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of them actually have to do with like a child being abandoned, um, which is an interesting psychological thing. Because the other one is Philomena. Have you ever seen Philomena? Love Philomena, yes. Such an underrated movie, right? Yes, it is. It's fantastic. I, I yeah, great. Oh, so great. And so, I mean, did you cry? Like I cried like a baby at that. I found it so something that really moves me a lot in movies is if the tone changes and the tone starts really funny in that movie and it then kind of abruptly shifts to sad and that right. really gets me, you know? Yes. So yeah, Roma, Philomena, Florida Project. I didn't see that one. Everyone told me it was great. I never watched it for whatever the reason. The ending destroys me. Yeah. Florida Project. Gangs in New York, I always cry in. That's a joke, right? <laughs> no. What? No. Yeah, I always cry in Gangs of New York. The, what? Yeah. The opening battle makes me cry every time. I don't just cry at, like, feel-good things. I Something about the opening battle, something about seeing them, like, this vision of man is just so primitive. And then, like, them fighting and just it's just like a very honest depiction of man as like still looking so primal. And then when the little kid, when, when uh, Liam Neeson dies and Leonardo DiCaprio, the little kid takes the, the knife and starts swinging it around. So you kind of see the violence pass over to him, you know? Yeah. There's just something about that that really moves. No, I know what you mean. I, I cry at 2001 when they throw the bone in the air. I just start <laughs> sobbing. Do you? No, no, <laughs> that's stupid. Um, and Mr. Schindler, Schindler's List to me, um, the idea of somebody doing so much and 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 wishing they had done more when he goes through the car at this watch. I'm and you're going to be like Schindler's List when they hang Ray Fiennes at the end. It's such a <laughs> <story>. <laughs> um, no, when he says, uh, I could have done more. And Ben Kingsley says, you did so much. Yeah. I mean, that is... Uh, so moving to me that's a cry moment and uh what if ben Dreams, was like probably probably could probably could have done a lot more um of course but uh field of dreams certainly uh dad you want to have a catch i mean forget about it that's a yeah. cry for me and um most re uh, or not most recently but very recently sing street is a movie that made me cry the wait is that the that's the irish movie yeah it's like called? 80s music i hear that's great the older, oh, it's fantastic. I think you'd like it. Maybe not. Who knows with you? But the older <laughs> brother stuck in the life, sending the, I'm, I'm giving away the end. I don't want to give away the ending. But that one makes me cry. Um, A League of Their Own made me cry the other day. Uh, Chicago <laughs> movies, Backdraft, that used to make me cry. Do you, silly. do you think there's a reoccurring reason you cry? Like anything that's reoccurring? Yeah. Wait, wait what do you mean? In that movie, like, a, like a, no, no, like a pattern. Like, not every movie because we cry for different reasons, and sometimes you just cry because something's sad. But do you think there's one thing that makes you cry in a lot well, of movies? Well, like, a yeah, consistent... I mean, the moment. I mean, we've talked about Home Alone uh, when he says how you feel about your family. It's a complicated thing. Obviously, that's deeply personal. I don't cry every time in that one. Rocky, the first Rocky, the only great Rocky, when he's in bed talking to Adrian, and he says, "I just want to prove that I'm not another bum from the neighborhood." Mm -hmm. I mean, that to me uh, makes me just that makes me cry. But yeah, it's things that I relate to. Like, again, Sing Street, I can't really talk about without giving away the fucking climax. But somebody being sort of stuck in a life and rooting for someone to get out of the life. Right. Is um, so emotional to me. And that's how I feel about my own life of getting out of the so getting it. Yeah. 
getting out of the 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 the, the town. So that's a big one. It's yeah. stuff about getting out of the town, stuff about family. And family. Yeah, and then and Schindler's List, the idea of like, did I do enough? Was my life valuable? Did I give enough? As give did I give as much as I. I could, which is something that I think we'll all wrestle with at the end. Yeah, I mean, with Schiller's List, you don't need to find a psychological reason. It could just be that the juice. <laughs> You're like, how do I relate to this for my own? Why is this well, I do <laughs> relate the most to a Nazi. Um, he does uh, pull off a Nazi pin and be like, I could have saved more Jews with this Nazi pin I held on to. That's true. One more in the music. By the way, the song in Schindler's List, I believe, in my, I mean, I don't know, I don't understand classical music as much as other people. I'm going to sound like a Philistine, but to my, for my two cents, the greatest instrumental song of all time. The, the Schindler's main, List. The song, main yeah. song, yeah. Um, oh, and by the way, It's a Wonderful Life, which is another one about value and service. That's the movie that makes me cry the most. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago. The, to my big brother, George Bailey, the richest man in town. I mean, that makes me sob. People, lining up and coming in to say you did so much for yeah. me, which is same as Schindler's List, essentially. So uh, it seems like almost like approval would be the reoccurring theme. Approval that you did the right thing. Approval that you made something out of yourself looking for like kind of like acknowledgement and approval, right? Of like course, yeah. I mean, look at the career we've chosen. I mean, to me, that's like my ultimate sort of fan. That's the problem with, now we're getting into deep psychology, but this idea of like, obviously I didn't get something growing up that was like, no, right. you're of a value, you're, you're meaningful. And so any movie, Big Fish is another one of my favorite movies. Father, um, father, son. Father, son, exactly. And him dying, being taken to the river with everyone he's ever loved. That's something that makes me emotional. The feeling of like everyone you've ever loved being in a room. Right, which is exactly like, uh, uh, you know, it's a wonderful life. Exactly, yes. So everyone telling you like, yeah, getting a sense of acknowledgement or yeah. No, um, sorry, what? I was just going to say at my wedding, which I, I didn't know you too well then, um, but so that's why you weren't there. But yeah, and yeah. now you wouldn't have been a, my next wedding. You won't be able to the dreams. <laughs> but the feeling of like our first dance, we didn't want to dance by ourselves like assholes and make everyone watch. So we had everyone come out and like the floor was just flooded with everybody I've ever known in my life or loved. And I could I was like sobbing. I could not stop crying because right. I was like, here's a celebration with everyone I love. Yeah, no, that's great. And I think that's like, a, you know, it's crying that comes from a lot of sense of gratitude. I think it's very well adjusted. You know what I mean? You, you're being triggered by a good thing. You know what yes. I mean? Like, uh, I think for me, a lot of them are like childs that have been abandoned, like Roma. You know, she loses right. a child. And then Mystic River, the child. And then Philomena, she loses a child. Right. And Gosford Park, which, have you seen that? Yeah, I saw it in the, you said you loved it. I saw it in the theater and the, to be fair, I was 17, but I was like, what is this bullshit? Yeah, that's one of the greatest movies of all time. You should watch again, it's incredible. But that also is about giving up a child. And I did years ago, this girl I was having sex with, she was pregnant and it, could, it was between me and like two, I think this might be the reason I cried. It was between me and two other people, right? And she yeah. really thought it was mine. And I thought I was gonna become a father, you know? Whew. And then to the and then we had a paternity test and then the baby was born. She sent me a picture. She's like, it looks just like you, but a lot of babies look like me. Just <laughs> and she's like, it looks just like you. But then what happened is the other guy was black. And when a baby's born, like it's not black right away. It kind of, I mean, I don't know how to say this in an unproblematic way, but the baby kind of darkens after the first couple of days. Well, if you leave it outside. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, the baby they didn't become black. Black is not a choice, obviously, but the baby blackened? I'm going to get canceled for this. The baby got blacker and it wasn't my kid because I'm not black. Right. I would love if after everything <laughs> I've said on Tuesdays with Stories, if you got canceled. Because <laughs> some fucking, some person that loves Field of Dreams is like, fuck this guy, I'm taking him down. It'll probably happen. And uh, I, I don't have much to be canceled from. Um, no, that's true. But uh, but yeah, so I think maybe that possibility of like I could have had a kid, but I didn't. I think that maybe affects me personally. Right. Interesting. But also the movies I cry at are all like masterpieces. So I just have, you know, they're just great movies, you know. They're, yeah. they're also very sad what happens in the movie. It's not just that, you know. Yeah, there are masterpieces, unlike Rocky and It's a Wonderful Life and Schindler's List. <laughs> Those fucking pieces of garbage that I named. <laughs> that, that bullshit. Field of Dreams really taints the whole uh, group. But uh, all right, let's have some fun. Right. Let's talk all about right. Bull Durham. I assume you I like. I know Bull it was Durham. a great moment just now. So crying though. That was nice crying. That was crying good, was right? Good. Um, 
<laughs> All right, Bull Durham. Uh, Bull sorry, Durham. I, could, I could go on about crying. We should just do a whole episode about crying. I thought we just did a big chunk of it, I guess. We just did. Like <laughs> <movie>. <laughs> hey, Joe, we just did. That's See, that's like <laughs> latter day. That's latter day um, fucking Steven Spielberg. We just oh, yeah, did. we just did. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, I couldn't uh, even get through Saving Private Ryan. I tried to watch the rest of it, and I was like, "This is really? garbage." Yeah, yeah, it's it's the 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 first part and the last part are both great, but yeah, the middle is bad. Um, yeah, Bull Durham was I watched it today or last night today. Really funny, good characters, conflict, good conflicts. Um, <laughs> do you know the ages of uh, Tim Robbins and Kevin Costner in it? I looked you know it up. I- I used to so so Susan Sarandon is forty two I think in that movie yes. forty one forty two and so sexy I, I'm like people I got in a fight online one time like Susan Sarandon particularly in that movie I, is I, so outrageously sexy you're gonna hate me but there's a bathroom right there I've been holding it in for like ten minutes this will literally be ten seconds I don't even think we'll have to edit this afterwards all right I'll keep this talking about how hot seconds. Susan Sarandon right. is. don't talk shit about me this is Just hilarious talk about yeah have a bottle yeah I'll talk about Susan Sarandon I mean. I can't even, I'm blown away by the unprofessionalism of Rana. And, you know, I don't want to sound racist, but is there anything Jewier for lack of, you can hear him pissing. I mean, everyone can listen to his stream. Is there anything, I don't want to say Jew, I already said it, but I mean, then excuse me, I need to go to use the bathroom. But decent stream. I would love if he just took a big shit right now, if he just heard a big plop, but People hate me. They think I'm stupid. But Susan Sarandon in uh, Bull Durham, I just find so sexy. You see a little bit of nipple. I noticed that when I was a kid. And, uh, you know, she's old as shit and she's got red hair, which is gross, but really sexy. And it's hard to say all this while Ronan is gone because I'm going to have to say it all over again. But Bull Durham is great. He's a nitwit for not liking Field of Dreams. No conflict is crazy. There's conflict with... Uh, the bank, obviously, they're going to lose the farm. I mean, that goes on and on. We don't know what he's going to do with the farm. This conflict between him and Terrence Mann, they almost get in a fight. It's it's just ridiculous. So much conflict. Everyone heard you pissing. Sorry. Sorry. I had, a, I had a real like Tom Hanks piss from League of Their Own. It just kept on going. <laughs> I know. And it's the audio picked it up perfectly. Oh, did it really? Yeah. I paused for a minute to just listen to it. And you came back sweatier. Who sweats when they piss? <laughs> My exercise for today. Um, <laughs> Anyways, I was just talking about how sexy Susan Sarandon is. Was that what you're talking about? I talked a little bit about how there's a ton of conflict in Field of Dreams, but I don't want to get back in there. <laughs> All right. Um, so, yeah, she's very sexy. Uh, she's great. Well, an amazing. One of the a great, like, uh, female role. Great character for, you know. Great character. Um, whether, whether, as many good developed female roles, you know. Yeah, great character. She's amazing. They're all great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So Kevin Costner's. So guess the ages. Tom, uh, I mean Tim Robbins. Okay. By the way, Tim Robbins this, is. Yeah. He's twenty-seven. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say Costner's thirty-six, and uh, and and the old old bag is forty-two. <laughs> She's forty-two. Uh, Costner's thirty-three. Okay. And Tim Robbins is thirty. He's only okay. Three years older. Yeah. But uh, I'm kind of interested in that just because I'm like, when I watch movies like that, I always assume everyone's older than me because in my head I think I'm like younger than i am right we're old now but but i'm like older than all those people except for susan sarandon no one's older than her (laughs) Um, i was on a plane with her one time and i walked by and i was like i've seen your tits it's so wild what have you seen her tits in you can see her tits in bull durham i don't i guess you didn't you haven't watched it 50 times at the end when he when he like kind of removes her her briefly uh, she's in the bathtub and there's another moment through the shirt and then there's another like a nipple yeah, yeah you can see nipple yeah I missed it. Get back in there. Yeah, it's fast. I get but, better glasses. Um, but also there's a movie when she's young. I forget the name of it, but she's like super naked in it. She had a long run of being hot. Like, you know, like her, her hotness spanned decades. Yeah, I think so. It was like this was is like, where, all the comments are going to be about this, by the way, because people think she's hideous. Well, she's not my cup of tea, um, but I recognize how hot she is. Well, she, I, I, but her hotness did span from like 18 to like 60. I feel like she had like a really good run, you know? Right. Um, but yeah, she's not, I mean, you have, you like the older woman thing, right? Yeah, I guess so. I, I which is very woke, one. which is very woke. Oh, um, I'm woke, baby. You're like one of the more woke comics. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just from marrying Sarah, you're so woke. <laughs> yeah, uh, totally. 
But, uh, and she's also like such a, men- it's like a very sexy mentor kind of thing, you know? Yeah, she's all about sex, sex and baseball. I mean, that's my life, basically. Those are my two <laughs> favorite things. So she's well, and poetry. Cool. It was stuff for me, too. I could get into it. They threw some Walt Whitman in there, some poetry. Hell it was yeah. a very literary movie. I, I thought it was great. I, I mean, I can't say many bad things. I thought it was a great conflict. I thought um, you got this great tension between Kevin Costner and Tim Robbins. And, and like, Kevin Costner obviously looks really cool in the movie. He's kind of a badass, you know? Yeah, he's sexy, too. He's very sexy, but he also like, you know, there's some sadness with him, you know, being the the best player in the minor leagues. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there's like a great, uh, what do you call it? Like, it's a movie, it's one of the few, like it's a sports movie, but it's more about like acceptance than like, you know, just being like a, you know, winner. You know what I mean? See, this is mind blowing and angering that you can watch Bull Durham and you do this a lot with movies that you're like, it's not even about baseball. It's about acceptance. <laughs> and then you watch Field of Dreams and you're like, it's not about anything. And I'm like, are I'm you just saying it's ex- I know it's about things. I'm just saying it's executed. Let's, let's talk about Bull Durham. <laughs> I know, but it's just endlessly frustrating for you to watch Bull Durham and be like, it's not even about minor league baseball. It's about acceptance and, and Reaganomics. Well- I'm well, like, well, well, there's like, well, I know Field of Dreams isn't just about ghosts and baseball, but like, there is like a conflict, like actual conflict and a great conflict between all three of them. It's an awesome triangle. Uh, it reminded me of this movie that's amazing. Have you ever seen Fabulous Baker Boys? Yeah, I think that's a Linklater movie. No, no, no. no. It's um. What's the Linklater movie with the brothers? Oh, that's something else. Yeah, that's like, was, is that, uh, yeah. Is that like a Western with Matthew McConaughey? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not that. It's a, it's a movie with Jeff Bridges and Bo Bridges and Michelle Pfeiffer. I feel and, like I saw that, but I don't know it too well. Jeff Bridges, is a, it's a perfect metaphor for like a road hack because he's like this amazing jazz pianist, but instead of like playing great jazz, he just goes on the road with his brother and they play at like nursing homes and like just like restaurants. They're just like, they became like a corporate act, you know? Right. But, uh, but it's great. But anyway, yeah, I thought, yeah, I thought it was hilarious. Um, and, and very adult. It's a very adult movie, don't you think? Like, yeah, it's. I was just listening to the commentary with uh, Costner and Tim Robbins, which is fun. But I guess Ron Shelton, who wrote it, was his directorial debut. He also made um, uh, White Man Can't Jump and a couple other things that I'm forgetting right now. But he was a minor league baseball player, yes. and that's why it's so. Um, everyone, all, all the baseball players say it's it's the movie that got baseball the best. Um, Oh yeah, because he he played in the minors, and there's great baseball stuff. And Kevin Costner's a switch hitter in the, in the movie, which I don't know if you noticed that he hits from both well, sides of the plate. Ambidextrous? No, that's not ambidextrous. He just hits from both sides of the plate. Yeah, which is not a metaphor, I don't you, think. Do but, you really think I would have noticed that? <laughs> um, <laughs> would you have been very surprised if I did? I didn't even uh, know switch hitter. I would have. I think most people don't notice it, so it's a fun little fact. But I was listening, and Ron Shelton said. He wanted all those swears in there, and they said, "What do you, what do you make of the TV version?" He's like, "Fuck the fucking TV version." He's like, "I hope this movie's never on TV or an airplane." So, because he really wanted to make it real. Yeah, there's something. Maybe it's because I would see these other like family-friendly movies about baseball, but there's something about it just seems so mature right away. It's just like very open about sex, and about like you know like career and like I don't know. It's a very honest portrayal of people you know and they're just like fucking and it's like very political kind of fucking i don't know very uh it was very honest and very adult and very sexy. yeah and the characters are all so well written and so well defined and um and hilarious and there also is so many parallels with comedy the getting older and and trying to look out for the young guy and being jealous of the new guy passing him uh, but still having this wisdom it is this uncomfortable thing that happens in comedy a lot where you want to be a mentor but then the person you're mentoring passes you up. <laughs> right, right. Oh, of you know, and it's just like so uncomfortable. Like I remember one time, like I was I was doing a festival and I was doing well at it, right? Oh, it was a uh, laughing skull. And I was talking to this young girl, uh, and like giving her advice, like being all cocky, and I was like attracted to her, and she had got kicked out. She had already got, you know, like she had already got in um she already lost in the festival, the competition. And I was giving her all this advice and trying to look all mentory. And then the next week she was on Fallon. That's <laughs> and hilarious. Just, and I just felt like so, she, she just surpassed me so quickly. And I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? Giving advice because I went, went farther in a fucking competition. That's, so that's great. Yeah, it is. It's something in comedy a lot. You really got to beware of like being too mentory because 
the young will pass you up, and then you feel like a fucking asshole. No, I had that with like Dan Soder. I was like, I'll show you around, <laughs> Pat. Like Dan Soder was like answering phones at Stand Up New York, literally. And I was like, come to Caroline's with me. I'll take you there. <laughs> and uh, same with Norman. I'm like, hey, hey, come open for me in Hartford and uh, all this. Like and 12 different comedy legends that you used to refer to as kid. <laughs> yeah, 100 percent. And I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll teach you the ropes, sonny boy. And it's, it, yeah, it's tough. It's tough because then you you go from that to jealous, you know, and it's just like a weird. And that's what happens in this. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, exactly. That, but then, of course, it's acceptance. And then the not being able to hang it up when he's, he's cut and then he's taken the bus to another place is so great. I love that. I love the ending. It's beautiful. I, it is interesting. So when he throws, uh, when he doesn't listen to the catcher, when he doesn't listen to Kevin Costner and Kevin Costner just tells yeah. the hitter of the play, that's pretty crazy, right? Or is that like a thing? Like that, that seemed like a pretty crazy thing for him to do. Yes, that's yeah, that's the point of the point of that. Well, I guess, um, I guess what I found interesting in it is like he wants to be this mentor role, but this this movie goes way beyond just the mentor trope. You know what I mean? Because right. a lot of movies where someone's a mentor and they really are a mentor, and it's just not a real human being. They're just the mentor, and he wants to be the mentor, but there's a real human being under that. You know what right. I mean? But it has its own self, but he does have wisdom. Yes. And he is mentoring in that scene. And and the mentoring is don't, you don't shake off your catcher, especially a veteran catcher. You're new. I know what I'm doing. This is the pitch and you're shaking me off. So fuck you. But you could also look at another layer, which is that is true. But on the other hand too, he doesn't want to be proven wrong. So he makes sure, you know, yes, he's giving him wisdom, but he's also, yeah, covering his bases because he'd look like a real asshole if any probably could have been proven wrong. So there's that interesting, it it delves into the ego of the mentor, which is, which is very fascinating. There is, I agree, but well, I'll just say, I think he would have been right because we've shown that he knows so much and and Nuke knows so little. So he would have been right either way. He but, probably would have been right, but that doesn't mean there isn't still a, a feeling in him to be like, let's make sure he doesn't prove me of right. Course, you know of mean? course, of course, because he doesn't want to be embarrassed himself, which is, is, is depicted well throughout the movie. And also there's the great moment right after where he yells at the guy for showing up his pitcher. He's like, get out of here, you fucking idiot. Yeah, yeah Go yeah. run. And all, all those, from a technical standpoint too, those handhelds when they're doing the inner dialogue is great. It's only <laughs> handheld when he's coming up to the plate and having that inner dialogue and then on the mound with them. It's also, that's great. It's also hilarious. Like at first, like the way they have Tim Robbins just speak out loud, his thoughts. Yeah. Like for anyone else in a movie, you'd be like, that's a cheap trick. But he's so dumb. It feels very believable that he would just think out loud. Yeah. (laughs) And it's a big part of sports. Yeah. And there's also another great moment I noticed with the blocking where early on, where in that same scene where um, uh, Crash is coming to, Kevin Costner is coming to the mound and um, and Nuke, Tim Robbins says, uh, I want to release my, my authority. I want to appear as authority. Whatever he says, I yeah. want to break on the scene. I and he's to, literally yeah. backpedaling. Like, like Kevin Costner is <laughs> yeah. walking him back as he's like, I want to make my parents, my presence known. Show my, yeah, show I, my, announce yeah, yeah. my presence, I think he says. And he's literally backpedaling because he's <laughs> intimidated by Kevin Costner. He does. Kevin Costner does look so much cooler than him the whole fucking time. There's also a funny part where Kevin, he's wearing the garter. And yes. Kevin Costner's like making fun of him for, I guess, looking like a little gay. Yeah. But he makes fun of him by slapping his naked ass, which is <laughs> a little interesting. I don't know. Is, is that just a normal thing in sports to just slap a naked I ass? I think so. Yeah. There's a lot I of. And I get over the pants, but like a naked ass? Yeah, I think Even so. A little sexual. I suppose so. I mean, the whole movie's <laughs> sexual. Yeah. Also, by the way, one, not to change immediately, but one of the great comedic scenes, Robert Wool. When he comes up and he goes, well, candlesticks make a good thing. And he goes around, and he goes, okay, let's get two. <laughs> I mean, that's like, that's like poetry. I fucking Beautiful. love Robert Wool. I've always loved Robert Wool. I think he's, he's the real hero in the original Batman. And I, you know, and I, I'm, I've always like been a big fan. I mean, he's like a poor man's Albert Brooks, but I still like, <laughs> I still love him that's quite a, a bit. <laughs> uh, was he a stand-up or like a. I think probably, I think everybody was though. I think yeah, Costner right. and yeah, Robbins yeah, were too. <laughs> but, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's also funny that you love, you hate Tim Robbins, and yet I feel like he's in like seven of your favorite movies. Yeah, I love Shawshank. I love Bull Durham. I love Top Gun. Um, How do you reconcile that? Because he's obviously good in well, Bull Durham. Bad actors can be in great movies. He's good in Bull Durham, but he's good because he's playing a, a dipshit. Like he's it's not, it's not, Kevin Costner is better in the movie. It's a more, uh, 
it's a more difficult role. It's a more diverse role. And Susan, Tim Robbins is outacted by the other two leads in the movie. He's a bit, he, he's kind of one note, I guess, or he's just a yeah. simpler person. And he is, he's ridiculous too. He doesn't really look like a great pitcher as the Kevin Costner looks like a baseball player. He's got a great right. swing. He can play Tim Robbins. You're like, that guy's not throwing fucking hard at all. <laughs> But, um, but Tim Robbins, he does stupid well, like very well. He does. He is good. That's his best <laughs> movie, I think. And 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 some scripts can carry a, a a mediocre actor. And I don't think he's bad. I just think he's mediocre. And I think he's bad in some moments. I mean, one of the hilarious. I feel like they could have delved a little more into it. One of the funnier lines is in terms of his stupidity is he literally says, "Want to take this outside while they're on a moving bus?" Right. <laughs> 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 which I feel like should have had Kevin Costner be like, we're on a bus, you fucking idiot. Like, I feel like that could have deserved a good rebuttal there. You yeah. Know? It, and, and also it doesn't feel like he listens to Iron Maiden. Doesn't f- exactly feel right. It just feels <laughs> yeah. like they went with like, that's a dopey thing. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I enjoyed it and I, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's about getting older, even though he's really not that old. And we're, isn't it sad that it's about getting older and we're like five years older well, he's baseball. Well, we're in comedy, but in baseball, right, right, right. he's getting older, especially to be in the minor leagues and you're going on a bus and making crazy low money. There's a great book called Where Nobody Knows Your Name about minor league baseball. <laughs> and that makes me cry. The first like four pages of that book make me cry. Well, it's really sad that he's, I mean, one of the more sad things is him, uh, you know, about to be the, 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 what, what's the heavyweight champion or whatever. The home run king. <laughs> the home run king. It doesn't want anyone to know because it's like being the tallest dwarf or whatever. Like, yeah. That's like a beautiful. That's actually a beautiful part when he does it. He does it. Yeah. And then and she quotes the Thomas Gray poem about, you know, the path of glory lead but to the grave, you know, but the other yes. line from it. It's a, it's a beautiful, you know, there's some beautiful, there's some like, kind of si- sideways s sadness in the movie, you know, it doesn't delve as deep as sideways maybe, but there's some like, kind of like acceptance in the movie and sadness with that, you know, it is similar to sideways, I guess, in a way, you know, and the music is fantastic. Also in that movie, music's great. And the ending, the ending is that kind of sideways ending where he just like goes back and he says that beautiful line. I just want to be. Yes. Oh, it's there's a couple, like there's some, Oh, there's a, what's the other amazing line. There's that other amazing line where she's fucking him. And she says, Kevin Costner's name. And and he gets all upset. And then she goes, would you rather me make, love to him saying your name or making love to you saying his name which is a great way to get out of that i feel it it is yeah i i mean it's a great moment and great line and i i I made note of that one myself it is a great moment and uh and it's a perfect line for a guy who's dumb like him yeah like who's like oh yeah good point like i would be like just to the animalism yeah well yeah yeah, i'd rather get fucked than be (laughs) yeah i would be like that doesn't matter i mean that's like a good line it's a clever line but also one of my favorite lines in any movie ever that i quote all the time is sometimes you win sometimes you lose and sometimes it rains (laughs) which i think is a, a deeper has deep meaning it does. No, the movie is deep. And I'll say this, I feel like, especially movies back then, I feel like it has a stronger, more in- independent, more developed woman character than a lot of other movies that attempt to be deep or whatever. You know, like for, it's a sports movie and I feel like it's one of the best woman characters, you know? She's independent. She's like, she's smart. She has power. You know what I mean? She like, I mean, granted she fucks everyone who plays for the team, but like, she's but like that's a great- empowering. Yeah, that's empowering. She's a great autonomous character. Like, it's one of the best, like most women in movies are not written well and are written just to be used, you know what I mean? But like she, just as an object, but she's like a powerful force in the movie, you know? Yeah, and she knows um, she knows her baseball. And by the way, I would amend what you just said back then, because the last five years, there's nothing but strong powerful beautiful female roles in in fucking every saying. movie that's good yeah that's what i'm saying though a lot of times it's like it, to me like there's a different like you could say wonder woman is like a powerful strong role but it's not like a real person no but that movie's bullshit that movie sucks yeah. i'm talking about like um uh what's it called um diary of a teenage girl francis yeah, yeah, ha yeah. Uh, yeah, sure, portrait yeah. of a lady on fire we just watched the movie called pieces of a woman last night yes i mean so many I great guess- movies like that I guess what I find surprising Lady in this is that you would think it's not just that like it's a baseball movie where these two guys are fighting over a woman. 
And that scenario, you would definitely not imagine in your head this amazingly developed woman character. That's the kind of scenario where you think, especially when two guys are fighting over a woman, that's the kind of thing where you think like the woman would just be used as a prop, you know? Right, right. And so it's like a big surprise to me, like that she's so well developed, you know? Even Sideways, which is a great movie, like the woman is not that well developed in it, you know? Uh, I I guess, yeah. I mean, I maybe you just don't see her. <laughs> but, um, every I woman is just so shallow in every movie, and they're just like boring, and you know, yeah. But uh, a lot of women hate Sideways now, by the way. Well, that's because a lot of women are fucking idiots. That's uh, what I said <laughs> to Chloe Radcliffe. She got really mad at me. Really, um, Chloe didn't like Sideways. A lot of women say they say this thing, which is like the worst thing ever. I, I hate when people say this about it. They go, "Who cares about a bunch of white?" old older men or something a bunch of older men i hate this thing where it's like you can't make a movie about certain like groups anymore you know yeah well that's coming from your woke team yeah i i i <laughs> I, I am not a fan and people say the same thing like when succession came out which is an amazing show who cares about a bunch of rich people like what do you mean any life is interesting if you do it well you know yeah that's how i feel about field of dreams but i, I mean <sighs> well <laughs> no that that's a like a, a crazy thing to say i mean like side to me, and I don't, I don't mean Chloe's By a the friend way, of mine, so I'm not talking about Chloe, but like if, if someone watches Sideways and is like, this movie sucks, I'm like, oh, I don't, then we're not. Like Field of Dreams, I'm like, okay, you watched it in your 30s. You don't like baseball. You have no heart, whatever. I can still yeah. respect you. But, but Sideways, yeah. Sideways, not that I don't respect, but I'm like, if you don't like the movie Sideways, then I'm like, I, I don't know if we can even have a conversation here. I have a theory that the women who don't like Sideways are ones who maybe their father were kind of a dick. You know, it's all psychological. So maybe their dad was kind of an asshole. And then you're watching these two older men, like, you know, try to have sex on the road and all that shit, maybe, you know, right. psychologically. But sometimes, it's obviously a great movie. Also, sometimes people, I think, see a movie and they're in a mood. They just got in a fight or, you know, they're they were fucking, you know, they just right. broke up, whatever it is. And then they or they just don't get it or whatever. There's a lot of movies I've seen the first time I was like, I don't really know, whatever. And then they're like my favorite movie ever. <laughs> It is interesting, like you try to have like objective criticism, which you can never fully have like object, but you attempt to have objective to rise above, you know, but the two factors that make so much of movies are the mood you're in when you saw it. And I think probably most important, the expectation you were in before you watched it. Did you think right. you're about to watch a great movie? Did you think we're watching a bad movie? That expectation thing for me defines so much. Yeah, that's a big thing. I mean, you probably had low expectations of Field of Dreams. You probably like, this is stupid. It's about ghosts, whatever. But then I would have liked it because low expectations will make it good. A lot of times I'll watch a movie that I had no expectations. I'll love it because it was pretty good, but I had no expectations. Then I'll tell my friend and say, it's amazing. And then he'll watch it and not like it because it's not good enough to live up to the hype. It was just good enough for me to like it without any expectations, you know? Well, whatever happened with Field of Dreams, I don't know what happened, but <laughs> it's a terrible thing. Uh, we should wrap up. We've been going for fucking longer than Bull Durham last. <laughs> longer than Schindler's List, yeah. Well, uh, let's do, I mean, I guess we can do the ranking, but it's only three. It's harder. It's, and know. it's pretty easy. By the way, a Major League is, is amazing, and it's hilarious, and it's one of the best comedies ever. It's so fucking funny. And I feel like this was a good one. Though. I feel like we really talked about some, uh, you know, we got, there was anger. There was, there was so much more conflict in this and in Field of Dreams. There was like actual tension and like anger and the resolution was earned at the end. Yeah. <laughs> Ron, Ron, do you want to have a catch? <laughs> um, uh, so ranking them obviously is easy. Yours, is, number one is Bull Durham. A League of Their Own is two and Field of Dreams is three. I mean, that's what I just told easy. you something that was like so obvious the reason I didn't like Yeah, you know, for something, my dad only did catch us my brother, never me. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I just hate Field, Field of Dreams, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's, obviously it's Bull Durham, League of Their Own and uh, every other baseball movie, every other sports movie, every other movie and then Field of Dreams. <laughs> yeah. you get well my number one is field of dreams number two is bull durham but they're very different kinds of movies to me and they're not that far apart even though I've, they're two of my favorite movies ever and yeah. um a league of their own i love also but a league of their own is like i love it i've seen it um it's funny it's sweet it, it's touching that has that line that i mentioned that's one of my favorite lines ever but it's not on par with the other two movies in my mind. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's just yeah. I, I didn't think it's I, I didn't think it was great, but it, it it is really funny. And that John Lovitz moment is. We should bring back ugly humor. If the other if both people are ugly, 
I'll do it next episode. I'd be happy to. <laughs> well, I said of both people. So yeah, it worked out. Um, That's hurtful. Um, <laughs> I, that was the premise. But uh, yeah, so yeah, it was it was good though. I enjoyed, I enjoyed watching uh, two of them. But uh, are we good? I mean, I feel like Mark Marin now. I feel like you're so much anger here. No, I feel great. I can't wait to, uh, you know, do something else. But that's um, my person. It's so personal. Like, you know, it's so personal when you talk about movies. Because, like, I'm saying I hate Field of Dreams. But what you're hearing is me just saying your father doesn't love you or something. It's just like such a like a personal thing. No, like I said, I understand. Like, to me, Field of Dreams is a movie that I love and I think is incredible. But if people don't love it, I'm not upset. Like, I would right. be more upset if you didn't like Goodfellas and No Country for Old Men because That'd those be are masterpieces to me. Right, Field of Dreams you, isn't a masterpiece. Yeah. It's a movie that I think is great and I love so dearly. It means so much to me. It's a movie that connects you on an emotional level as a child. Yeah, but yeah, but critically, it's you, you connect to it more emotionally than critically, maybe. Right. I get more mad. I'm more mad at the people that say Casino is better than Goodfellas than I am with you thinking Field of Dreams is bad. Yeah, I think Joe Pesci's character is better, but uh, that's another time. We should do mobster movies at some point. Oh yeah, that'd be fun. Um, okay, we gotta wrap up. Everybody, if you're watching and you haven't subscribed, subscribe to the channel for God's sakes. And uh, I'm in Royersford, Pennsylvania, January 27th, next Wednesday, January 27th. And um, my special's on YouTube, I Hate Myself. And uh, you got a couple albums out there, right? Yeah, I got my album Downhill ever since. Another album that's not as good, but it's out there and there's nothing I can do about it. Um, same, I have the same thing. <laughs> and uh, I'm doing my solo show, Ron and Millie, on Sunday, January 31st at 7 p.m. Eastern on Zoom. Take a link in my bio at Ron on Comedy. It's free, R-A-A-N-A-N Comedy. And yeah, I'm back in New York uh, this uh, Friday. I can't wait. Okay, hopefully yeah. we'll... It'll be warm at some point. Wait, when are you back? Yeah. Friday? Yeah. Oh, you should come to Royersford. I'll come. What what yeah. date is what date is it? Wednesday the twenty seventh. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah. All right. I got it's, something on the twenty sixth. Yeah. Awesome. It's Hell yeah. Tanner and Sarah. So you'll have to be in the car with three of us. I don't know if you're okay with that. Yeah, I'll do it. I mean, you know, I was okay last time. Sweet. Great. Okay, cool. All right. Let's All wrap right. this up. I'll I'll hit stop. Hold on. All right. Bye everybody. Thank you for Bye. watching. If you made it this far, let us know. <laughs>